So your spirit, every day, um, it has to be, um, it has to be taken serious by your own soul. Like your mind has to be intentional about entering into the spirit. Because saints, the same way, like if somebody cut you off in the street or cut you off in a line, you know, it's easy for the mind just to just operate without no wisdom in the moment. But for you to get the mind over into the spirit, take a lot of effort. Like you have to be serious about getting the mind over to the spirit and what the spirit of God will like that moment to produce and conceive. So to get the, the, the mind and when I say the mind, I really mean that's the, 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 the soulish majors master, major master is the mind. But your soul also has your feelings, like your emotional place. So just think about this. When you make a decision to do things that's of the spirit, That's your will that's making the decisions. Your emotion may not want the spirit in that moment. I'm showing you how to go beyond how you, how you let yourself be hindered and apprehended by the enemy. I'm showing you something. Like say this, let, let me give you an example. Say I, I, my name is Jeffrey and I say I'm a prey at 3.30 p.m. Now, I'm, I, I'm deciding that that's my will in motion. But my emotions may not want 3.30 p.m. And so now my emotions will play tricks on my mind. So now I can't finalize what I decided. So I decided I'm going to pray at 3.30 p.m. My emotions said, no, I don't want to pray at 3.30 p.m. Now my mind is being manipulated by my emotions. So now the decision I made to operate in the spirit, and I made this decision with my will, it came under the attack by my emotions. And now it's manipulating my mind not to do it. So 3.30 come, I don't do it. And I don't do it not because I never made the decision that I was going to do it. I don't do it because I didn't also bring my emotions into the spirit. I didn't bring my mind into the spirit. So even though my will is saying in, through the will realm, I'm going to do it, I never do it. So the Bible said in Ecclesiastes to pay your vows. Why is this so important when it say pay your vows? Because a lot of times you are saying things to the Lord that is that that you are saying you're going to do it with your will. But you're not bringing your emotions and your mind in subjection to that. And you need these to be in subjection to that if you're going to actually do it. So let me give you another example. Jesus is laying down the life at the cross, his life at the cross. But you notice what emotions are in the Garden of Gethsemane. The emotions is saying don't lay down the life at the cross. The emotions is feeling lonely. The emotions is feeling neglected. The emotions is feeling the weight of the sins of the world, which is the most heaviest weight ever in existence. There's no other heavier weight than the weight of the sins of the world. So all these things are weighing on Jesus emotionally. Now, Jesus's will is now underneath attack. You notice what the words of Jesus was. Not my will. Wait. Wait. Not my will, but your will be done. So think about it. Jesus is dealing with the will that he has. And he's saying disregard my will right now. 
but let your will override minds. Let your will be fulfilled. Let that which is in your will, what's in your soul, let that be my portion. So the Lord was so perfect in showing this display to let you see that there are times where your will is not God's will. What you will to do is not what God wills to do. And you have to be in prayer and in meditation as well, because meditation is like, uh, it's the realm of watching. Remember the Lord said, watch and pray, lest you fall into temptation. He was mentoring Peter to do that in the Garden of Gethsemane. But when you think about it, watching is just as important as praying. Because Jesus didn't just let him know just to pray. King Jesus was also saying, watch, which means that the meditation has to be on point. The meditation of the word, the meditation of the voice of God speaking to you, looking for him to say something to you in expectation. So now when you get that aspect correct, you're in a place where God could correct you and check you. The Holy Spirit of God could show you if something is off, it's wrong, and now the things that you have a struggle in accomplishing, whether it be prayer, reading the word, sowing the seed, obeying concerning someone else, obeying a divine instruction concerning someone else, you can do those things by force and by power and by ease because you have rendered up the soul properly. You have given the mind, the will, and the emotions over to the Holy Spirit. You have to do that on purpose because it's not just going to happen because there's going to be days that you're going to wake up and feel like blah. Did you know that? No matter how anointed you are, no matter how much glory you have on your life, there are going to be days where you wake up and it's like blah. That is a test. What you going to do? You going to end up on drugs? You're going to ignore the voice of God. You're going to shut down on people. You're going to stop working. You're going to stop praying. You're going to stop listening. You're going to stop serving. That means that there was no level of maturity birth in you to override the emotions when it's in the flesh, the will when it's in the flesh, the mind when it's in the flesh. And so now, that's agreement to just let Satan win the battle. Bible said, fight the good fight of faith. You lay hold of eternal life. You have to constantly usher as a parent, usher your soul like it's a child back into the spirit of God. You're not always going to be in the spirit all the time. You're not always going to be seen in the spirit. You're not always going to be operating in the spirit. You're not always going to be sensing and, and, and discerning in the spirit. The flesh also is going to talk. And when I say the flesh, I really mean that this is the gates of hell. The, these are the demons of the gates of hell. They are going to have a say so in moments and they're going to interject things to you, even if you are in the light. You notice Adam is in the light, but the enemy still talks. What was the reason for Achan to take from the enemy's camp? Because he's been chosen by Prophet Joshua, King Joshua, in the word of God to be in the army. So what was the reason for him taking from the enemy's camp and doing that instruction that God said not to do? It's completely him being in the light according to the position God put him in, but he's still reaching for darkness. So we're looking at the soul of Achan that even though God positioned his soul and scheduled his soul to be in the spirit of God, he still is reaching for the spirit of Satan, which is the flesh realm. And he accomplishes what the spirit of Satan wanted in the flesh realm. And then Satan's will was dispersed amongst everybody else in the army, amongst Joshua, 
and they lost the battle. So everything that Satan wanted to get done was done through the soul of one man. Imagine if one man could bring forth Satan's will in a situation simply because that man has refused to bring his soul into the light, into the spirit of God, but let his soul just be automatic and just follow its desires and its own will and its own plan. And he does it and it messes up what God intended. Just think about how powerful you could be if you constantly take your soul and you bring it into the spirit of God and you let the Holy Ghost empower you with the fresh anointing to do the things that you actually be purposing to do. I'm not going to lie again. Well, you got to bring the soul over to the Holy Spirit so the Holy Spirit could anoint the soul to block off lies. I'm not going to lust again. Well, you got to bring the soul to the Holy Spirit so that the Holy Spirit could anoint the soul, empower the soul, charge the soul. And then what did uh, James say in James chapter four? He gives more grace to the humble. So when you humble yourself before God and you let him know, I'm handing my cares over to you. I'm handing my soul over to you because I don't feel good today. I'm handing my, see, why don't you talk like that? Why don't you talk like that? Why don't you say to the Lord, Lord, today, I'm not feeling good. I can't put my hand on it while I'm not feeling good, but I hand over my soul to you. You ever did that? It's powerful. What did the Bible say in Peter chapter five, verse seven? It says, casting all your cares upon him, for he cares for you. So the Lord cares for you. That means that he's carrying around thoughts in his mind about your well-being. He, he cares for you. So when you care about something, you overthink about it. You think about it all the time. You're loaded with thoughts and, and concerns about it. Well, think about it. When you wake up, the Lord is carrying a multiple amount of thoughts, amount of thoughts in the direction of your well-being. So he's caring about what you're carrying. He's caring about what is disturbing you. He's caring about what is stressing you out. He's caring about your health. He's caring about your money. He's caring about your relationships. So remember what the word of God says. It says that, uh, The Lord will perfect that which concerns you. I think that's Psalm 138. I may be wrong, but it's in Psalms. He will perfect that which concerns you. Well, see, now we're dealing with him looking at your concerns. He's seeing things that concern you. And he perfects that which concerns you. So imagine if he's perfecting things that concern you, obviously he was investigating your concerns. So the beautiful thing about it is you have a word system in prayer that you could release to God to reposition your soul out of the flesh and into the spirit. Lord, I hand my soul over to you because I don't want to sin against you. Your words determine the direction of your actions. Your words determine the, 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 the route of your routine, the route of your your work, your, your behavior, your conduct, you are ruling that by what you converse with your mouth. So it's important that you learn to say the right things to the Lord. Now, what did the Bible say to come boldly before the throne of grace? Now, why did it say, why didn't it just say come to the throne of grace? It says come boldly to the throne of grace. Because when you go to the throne of grace, you need boldness. Boldness is a mental place where you are confident, courageous, and you are not entering into a place as if you are going to be denied, you're going to be embarrassed, you're going to be defeated. 
No, you're going into the place recognizing all favor is with me. The place that I'm going into is on one accord with me. So you can come boldly because you know that your request will be granted. So it says, come boldly to the throne of grace. Look, the reason why it says throne of grace, because there's different thrones. Isaiah chapter six is talking about Isaiah after King Uzziah died, he saw the Lord sitting on a throne. In the book of Revelation, then we hear about the great white throne judgment. And then uh, in Apostle Paul's gospel, we hear about the, the throne that's going to judge man, the judgment seat of Christ. That's another throne. And then we see that the 24 elders, they're sitting on thrones. 24 elders are sitting on thrones. So there's different thrones. Remember when there was an argument with the disciples, they was talking about who was the greatest and who was going to sit on the throne. And remember, the Lord, even in the Gospels, begin to talk about that people that overcome will be able to sit on the throne with him. I think that's actually in Revelation, the book of Revelation, where he talked about if you overcome, you'll be given to sit on the throne, to sit on the throne. I think that's book of Revelation, rather, or where, where you're talking about he that overcometh. So you look at the word, you see that there's different thrones. Oh, watch this here. That's Revelation chapter three, verse 21. It says, to him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me on my throne, in my throne. To him that overcometh, will I grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I overcame and I am set down with my father in his throne. So Jesus said, I'm going to let you sit in my throne. So you see that there's different variety of thrones. But the word of God talked about a throne of grace. The throne of grace, when you go there, it's dealing with God imparting new ability to you, new strength to you, so that you can accomplish the things that he desires to see from you in this life. Prayer, praise, honor, obedience, uh, maturity, growth, progress, consistency, faithfulness, praise, thanksgiving. That throne of grace is where you take on a new mindset, a new mantle in your mind to have energy to accomplish things and to get it done to full totality without lacking energy, lacking excellence, lacking vitality and strength, but you do it with power, you do it with completion, and you do it with joy. Psalm 100 said to serve the Lord with gladness. This is because you operate in a grace. When you pull from the throne of grace, you could. Now, when it says serve the Lord, serve the Lord is dealing with God's problems. God made angels to host him because he had problems. A problem is not as uh, 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 sometimes you hear a problem and you, you want to remove it from like God doesn't have any problems. That's why God made Adam. He had a problem. He needed a, a issue to be solved. God makes creation off of issues that he has. So he made the fish. There was an issue. Now we have Jesus multiplying five loaves and two fish. People are eating fish so that fish is solving the issue. God needed a man to release his dominion on earth. So the man that we see, Adam, is solving the issue. Then he says, I'm going to give you a help me. She's solving the issue. That These are all problems that birth creation. When God has a problem, his creativity is targeting that problem. So when you have a problem, God also releases creativity to you to solve that problem. Oh my gosh. There are many problems that you're facing in life. 
And there's a creativity. So let me show you. The woman with the issue of blood, she has a problem. But it unleashes creativity in her. Look at the creativity. If I just touch the hem of his garment. She didn't say if I just go to Peter. If I just go to John and ask them, could I meet Jesus for two minutes? If I just have a conversation with Jesus face to face. If Jesus just come to my house. No, her creativity brought her into exactness of the effectual weapon that would work the miracle. She didn't say if I touch his toes. She said if I touch the hem of his garment, I'll be made well. The problem unleashed a well and a grace of creativity and strategy inside of her to know what was going to cause the answer and the petition to be granted. So when you got problems in life, you should get excited because there is a well inside of you that is going to come forth if you get your soul back into the spirit. How does Satan stop the soul from getting to the spirit? Anxiety, fear, stress, worry. Perfect love casteth out fear. So perfect love is a dimension where God is able to rule the mind fully. He has the whole heart. Always remember this. If you're taking notes, write this down. Perfect love can only be exercised in me when I've given the Lord my whole heart. That means that there's no percentages of me that is entertaining perversion. And perversion is really a version of yourself that God didn't give you in the image of God.